plodding through a tropical rainforest with a weapon that might not work and mud up to your shins. Through the trees, there may be hundreds of men waiting in ambush with explosives and traps. Men with the ears of other men dangling on strings around their necks. The Vietnam War was a disaster for all sides, and this is why it was so terrifying. Viewer discretion is advised for this video, as some of this video may be offensive or disturbing. We, the makers of this video, in no way support or condone the actions of the subjects featured. A jungle of enemies. On November 14, 1965, the 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry Division was airlifted on Huey helicopters and dropped in a remote region in South Vietnam's Central Highlands near the Cambodia border. They were told there were North Vietnamese there who were up to no good, but they didn't know just how many there were. What happened next led to one of the deadliest battles of the Vietnam War, the Battle of Ia Drong. It was the first real sign for the Americans that this wasn't going to be a walk in the park. When the leader of the 1st Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel Harold Moore, touched down in the Ia Drong Valley, he and his men were extremely cautious. The extremely high regard that I have for the American soldier, he is the best fighting man that I have ever seen. And I would like for you, if you convey anything out of this area where we've been for the last three days and nights, please convey to the American people what a tremendous fighting man we have here. There were only 90 Americans on the ground at that point, with more coming in an hour. Within the first hour, they captured a North Vietnamese deserter who gave them some bad news. According to reports, he told them that there were three North Vietnamese regiments surrounding them that, quote, wanted very much to kill them but have not been able to find you. It seems the North Vietnamese just had their wish granted. More U.S. troops arrived soon after, but they were still outnumbered by about 10 to 1. Then, around noon, the jungle exploded. The North Vietnamese had moved up through the cover of the dense forest and were soon engaging the American troops in intense and deadly hand-to-hand -hand combat. Right, the Americans called for backup. The More troops arrived. arrived. Artillery and bombers were called in. But both sides were so close to each other that American bombers were taking out North Vietnamese and Americans. Then, night fell. The Americans hunkered down and could hear the North Vietnamese probe in the area trying to pinpoint where they were. War is terrifying enough during the day, but take away the light and it becomes a horror movie. Intense fighting continued into the third day, by which point the Americans had managed to secure a landing zone. The North Vietnamese had suffered some 1,200 casualties, and the Americans, 79. The Americans had the chance to get all their troops out on the third day, but General Westmoreland apparently didn't want the battle to look like a retreat, so some stayed behind they shouldn't have. On the fourth day, the two remaining battalions went to a second landing zone, LZ Albany. On their way, they were ambushed. The ensuing battle lasted for 16 hours, and it was an annihilation. North Vietnamese mortar rounds and other weapons took the lives of 70 Americans in the first few minutes of the ambush. More than 150 U.S. soldiers died in total that day, and hundreds more North Vietnamese. One of the few surviving platoon leaders, a guy named Rick Riscorla, described the aftermath of the battle as a long, bloody traffic accident in the jungle. The Battle of Ia Drong was the first major battle fought by the U.S. in the war, and by all accounts, it was a disaster. Things wouldn't get much better, and as the war dragged on and media coverage of it increased, it became clear that the U.S. was in for a much tougher fight than they'd bargained for. A Hidden Enemy In the Battle of Ia Drong, U.S. soldiers got their first real taste of what it was like to fight the North Vietnamese regular army. But maybe the more kill-machine soldiers were those who fought for the National Liberation Front, also known as the Viet Cong. These guys were like ghosts. They were well-versed in guerrilla warfare, knew the jungle terrain like the back of their hands, and had a penchant for donning civilian clothing and blending into local populations. They even snuck into the U.S. Embassy in Saigon and took control of it for a while in 1968. The North Vietnamese Army was the regular army of North Vietnam. Composed of well-trained and organized soldiers, they operated in a more conventional manner. The NVA employed conventional warfare tactics, including large-scale engagements, utilizing infantry, artillery, armored units, and coordinated offensives. 
They received support and guidance from the Soviet Union and China, and their operations were centralized under the command structure of the North Vietnamese government. But then you had the National Liberation Front, better known as the Viet Cong. They were guerrilla fighters who mostly fought in South Vietnam. The Viet Cong were made up of local insurgents who were sympathetic to the communist cause and were trying their best to overthrow the U.S.-backed government in the South. They used all sorts of guerrilla warfare tactics, including hit-and-run attacks, ambushes, sabotage, even booby traps. It was difficult to predict where they would be, or in many cases, whether they were even Viet Cong fighters at all. We waited for them in ambush. We engaged them in close combat. After this battle, my morale was very high because I had contributed to the liberation of the South. They were able to blend in with the local population and often didn't wear uniforms. Any American or South Vietnamese soldiers entering a village had to therefore be on high alert. There was a lot of paranoia that a VC soldier could be standing right there next to that grandma. Or was that grandma a VC in disguise? It made the soldiers very wary of the local population. Ambushes by the Viet Cong fighters disguised as civilians were not uncommon when American soldiers were patrolling villages or conducting operations in populated areas. Viet Cong deception and subterfuge was in full effect during the Tet Offensive. In late January 1968, during the Tet, the Vietnamese Lunar New Year, the Viet Cong, in collaboration with the North Vietnamese Regular Army, launched a series of surprise attacks in the South. On January 31st, a team of VC fighters disguised as South Vietnamese soldiers and civilians approached the embassy compound during the early morning hours. Dressed in either stolen or replicated uniforms, they carried fake ID cards and weapons hidden beneath their clothes. The attackers breached the embassy perimeter and engaged in a firefight with American forces stationed inside. The Viet Cong occupied the building for six hours before they were finally either killed or captured. But the fact that they were able to infiltrate the U.S. Embassy at all was crazy. During the Tet Offensive, the Viet Cong also hit a U.S. military base in Khe San, located near the demilitarized zone separating North and South Vietnam. There, the VC used a combination of conventional military tactics and disguise to stage the attack. Viet Cong fighters disguised as local peasants or workers planted explosive devices and carried out small-scale attacks around the perimeter of the base. The strategy was meant to distract and tie down American forces while larger-scale assaults were launched elsewhere. The Tet Offensive was ultimately unsuccessful for the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese, but it was a major turning point in the war. It exposed how little progress the U.S. and South Vietnam were making against the North. In the U.S., public opinion started to shift sharply, and anti-war protests picked up. The attack shattered the illusion that the U.S. and its allies were close to achieving victory in Vietnam. The widespread nature of the attacks caught many Americans by surprise and challenged the narrative that the war was being won. Tunnel Rats One of the reasons the Viet Cong were able to carry out so many surprise attacks during the Tet Offensive and throughout the war really was the fact that they had dug an incredible number of tunnels around Saigon and in many other regions across the country. It's estimated that there were tens of thousands of miles of them. They helped the armies move around in secret, carry supplies to different areas, send messages, house soldiers, and hold supplies. Finding these tunnels and exploring their dark, dangerous passageways was one of the most scariest jobs during the war. The people tasked with the job of entering these tunnels first and clearing them out were known as tunnel rats. These soldiers were specially trained for the job. They were typically smaller guys because the tunnels were often narrow and cramped. They didn't carry much gear and would crawl into the horrifyingly dark and claustrophobic tunnels armed with a weapon and a flashlight. Their objective was to search for enemy soldiers, weapons caches, booby traps, gather intelligence, things like that, Call of Duty campaign type of stuff. I chased somebody into a tunnel, met them at a bend in the corner in the dark. I thought I was alone and then I smelled their breath. Obviously, they had to deal with the threat of being ambushed around a dark corner by the Viet Cong or North Vietnamese. Many tunnel rats engaged in fierce close-quarter combat with almost no room to move around. And if the threat of the enemy wasn't enough, tunnel rats also had to deal with booby traps, which included explosives, pits lined with sharpened bamboo stakes, and strategically placed gift boxes filled with venomous snakes and spiders. Oh, no, 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 man. I can't do spiders. Mm-mm. Mm -mm. Life down there was pretty harsh. There wasn't much air, it was dark, it was damp, food was in short supply, 
Plus, it was the jungle. There were all kinds of dangerous creatures lurking down there, including venomous snakes, centipedes, scorpions, spiders, and of course, a whole lot of rats. Soldiers would often have to stay down there for days on end during particularly intense waves of U.S. bombing and would only come up during the night to scavenge for food and supplies. Plasmodium disease was also a big problem for the Vietnamese soldiers trapped in these tunnels. One Viet Cong report stated that around half of an entire Viet Cong unit had contracted the illness. One of the largest tunnel complexes was called Cu Chi. Careful how you say that. It was located just northwest of Saigon. In fact, if you ever visit the country and you're not claustrophobic, you can take a tour of them. The Cu Chi tunnel system was a major staging point for Viet Cong attacks on the capital. In 1966, U.S. and American forces tried to take out the system in a campaign called Operation Crimp, but despite leveling a lot of the jungle, a lot of the tunnels remained intact and were soon reoccupied by VC forces. It's estimated that some 45,000 people lost their lives in the Kuchi Tunnel during the war. Ghosts of the Jungle Imagine being at war. You're a soldier trudging through the wet jungle. Night is falling. You aren't sure where the enemy is, whether or not someone will pop out from behind a tree and get you with a bayonet. Then, in the distance, an eerie voice echoes through the trees. There are horrible wailing sounds, people crying out in pain, shrieks, and sobs. Then a voice calls out saying, I have come back to let you know that I am dead. I am dead. It's hell. I'm in hell. Don't end up like me. Go home before it's too late. Operation Wandering Soul, also known as Ghost Tape Number 10, was a secretive PSYOP conducted by the U.S. military in the jungles of Vietnam between 1969 and 1970. The operation involved creating fake audio recordings that were played from loudspeakers mounted on helicopters or ground-based equipment. The recordings apparently featured the sounds of restless spirits and tormented souls of dead Vietnamese soldiers, along with eerie music and voices of grieving relatives. In reality, they were recordings of South Vietnamese soldiers who'd been recruited to have their voices taped in a studio in Saigon. The recordings also included sounds of tigers growling, which the U.S. military picked up at the Saigon Zoo. The point of the whole thing was to exploit the Vietnamese belief in vengeful spirits and the importance of proper burial rites to unsettle the enemy and provoke fear. The belief in wandering spirits, or Ma Kui, was deeply ingrained in Vietnamese culture. According to Vietnamese folklore, when someone dies, their spirit may continue to exist and wander in the mortal realm if they have not received proper burial rites or if their death was untimely or unjust. These spirits are considered unsettled and restless, seeking out some sort of resolution or revenge for their untimely demise. Operation Wandering Soul tried to exploit this belief by convincing the enemy that fallen comrades who had not received proper burial rites would wander aimlessly in the afterlife, haunting those who didn't honor them. The recording included messages in Vietnamese, urging the enemy soldiers to abandon their cause and return to their families. Did it work? It's uncertain. There aren't many reports of North Vietnamese surrendering after hearing the spooky recordings. Bad Guns Now imagine you're pinned down deep in the jungle, surrounded by enemy forces shooting at you. You lift up your gun to fire back, and nothing, a nothing burger. It's jammed. During the early stages of America's involvement in the Vietnam War, jammed M16s were such a problem that a lot of soldiers resorted to picking up North Vietnamese AK-47s because they were more reliable. In the early 1960s, the U.S. military was looking to upgrade from its standard-issue military firing equipment. At first, there was a gun developed called the AR-15. Maybe you've heard about it. It seemed to be a good candidate. It was lighter, more accurate, had less kickback, and would inflict more damage than the M14. The AR-15 was initially adopted by the Green Berets, who thought its lightweight design and improved lethality was perfect for covert missions. But the suits in the military establishment had other ideas. They always do. They made some changes to the AR-15, effectively turning it into the M16. These changes included adding a manual bolt closure and changing something called twist, spiral grooves in the barrel that dictated how fast the bullet spun around. However, the suits decided that the M16 would be used with something called ball powder instead. No, not that ball powder. Ball powder had been around since World War II. It would be cheaper to produce and there were already supply chains established that would make it easier to distribute. Despite tests showing that the M16s were prone to jamming, 
The first guns were shipped over to Vietnam towards the end of 1964. The results of this hasty mashup of weapons tech were disastrous. Soldiers were stuck with dud guns in the middle of firefights. It was as if the U.S. soldiers were firing single-shot muskets from the Civil War era while they were being peppered with semi-automatic fire. Stories circulated of Americans found clutching cleaning rods in last-ditch attempts to free up their jammed weapons amidst the chaos of battle. One survey conducted in 1967, which was classified then but made available to the public now, found that a whopping 80% of 1,586 soldiers questioned reported that their weapon jammed up while they were trying to fire them during the war. Children of the Dust The term Bui Doi means dust of life in Vietnamese. It originated back in 1930s Vietnam and referred to poor people from the countryside seeking refuge in towns. During the 1930s, Vietnam was under French colonial rule, and the country had a lot of socio-economic disparities and rural poverty. Many rural residents were forced to leave their villages and migrate to towns in search of better opportunities, particularly in the urban areas under French influence. During the Vietnam War, this term was shifted onto children born from American fathers and Vietnamese mothers. Quite a few U.S. soldiers had relationships with Vietnamese women, and the children that resulted were often ostracized in both Vietnam and the United States. The mixed-race children, commonly referred to as Amerasians, faced difficulties in both Vietnamese and American societies. In Vietnamese culture, the stigma associated with being born out of wedlock and having foreign heritage often led to a hard life for them. In post-war communist Vietnam, these children were seen as symbols of fraternizing with the enemy. In 1970, the U.S. Defense Department stated that, quote, the care and welfare of these unfortunate children has never been an area of government responsibility. But five years later, as the U.S. was pulling out of Vietnam, an attempt was made to extricate some of these children of the dust. Operation Babylift began in tragedy. President Gerald Ford had just recently announced a U.S. plan to evacuate some 3,000 Amerasian orphans from around the country. And on April 4, 1975, the first cargo plane took off from Saigon, loaded with around 314 people. Many of them were children. Minutes into the flight, the plane crashed. 138 people lost their lives in the crash. Now, despite the horrible setback, Operation Babylift continued on. An estimated 3,300 children were evacuated from Vietnam, but the morality behind the whole operation has been questioned over the years. Tiger cages. Tiger cages sound like they should be used for, well, tigers. But during the Vietnam War, they were tiny cells used to hold people, cells that were barely big enough to hold a tiger, let alone multiple human prisoners. Tiger cages were small, often concrete trenches with bars on top. The point of them was to inflict pain and create conditions of extreme discomfort for whoever was trapped inside them. The South Vietnamese government and all its allies used their tiger cages to punish their enemies, including Viet Cong fighters and suspected sympathizers. The prisoners were packed tightly into the cages. Several people were often squeezed into a single cage where they could barely move or stand, let alone lie down. One of the most notorious sites where tiger cages were used was the South Vietnamese prison on Khon Son Island. Khon Son was a former French colonial prison that held a mixture of accused Vietnamese communists, ethnic and religious minorities, and political descendants. Conditions in the prison proper were bad enough. Guards were reported to throw quicklime, a caustic chemical compound, on prisoners. Quicklime caused painful skin burns and was not fun to have tossed on you while you were also in pain from malnutrition and disease. But tucked away in a corner of the prison were tiger cages. These cages held around 500 people. 300 men and 200 women. Conditions in these cramped cages were even worse. Prisoners there suffered from all kinds of physical conditions. Tuberculosis, open sores, infections, and malnutrition ravaged the people stuck down in the cages. There were stories of people who were so hungry they would grab bits of grass to eat. The tiger cages at Kansan Prison were supposed to remain a secret. But in 1970, a delegation was sent to check out the prison and make sure everything was above board. A congressional aide named Tom Harkin and a humanitarian volunteer slash translator named Don Luce learned about the tiger cages and took pictures of them. When the delegation wrote their official report, there was no mention of the cages. So Harkin leaked the photos he took to Life magazine. News of the cages was publicized and added more fuel to the growing fire that was public outrage towards the war. Ear Necklaces War can do horrible things to people for sure, 
but for an elite 45-man unit of the 104th Airborne Division, things got out of hand. Nicknamed Tiger Force, the unit was created in 1965 in order to out-guerrilla the guerrillas. They were trained in the art of stealth combat, surveillance and reconnaissance, and sent into the jungle. In 1968, they were given the Presidential Unit Citation by President Johnson, an award for exceptional bravery and fortitude demonstrated by an entire unit. But years later, a reporter at a small Toledo newspaper called The Blade unearthed some grisly documents. The documents consisted of a covered-up war crimes investigation and interviews with soldiers and witnesses that detailed how the soldiers of Tiger Force had rampaged through South Vietnam in the summer and fall of 1967, taking out as many people as they could. The unit's commander, Colonel Gerald Morse, liked to be called Ghost Rider. The soldiers went well beyond the quota suggested by Colonel Morse. By the end of the 67 campaign, they'd racked up more than 1,000 lives. Members of Tiger Force went about sadistically taking out whoever crossed their paths. Scalping was a common practice. Some soldiers made nice little necklaces that were all ears, if you know what I mean. In an interview, one medic who was part of the unit estimated that they took out 150 people in just one month. By 1971, stories about the atrocities being committed by Tiger Force led to a secret investigation in which the Army judged that a lot of the stories were true. In the end, though, no one was prosecuted and six of the most compromised soldiers were allowed to quietly resign. In 1975, the whole investigation was buried until it was unearthed in 2003 by that report from The Blade. Wars are terrible in so many ways, and the war in Vietnam was no different. It was terrifying for most everyone involved, and it came at a time when more journalists were documenting the war more than any war previously, which brought the horrors of it into people's living rooms for the first time. Thanks for watching. What other wars would you like to learn about? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.